Hey, it's Jordan with TYT, TYT Politics. I'm here in Sacred Stone Camp. We got a uh, building going on. We got uh, lunch going on. A uh, lot, of, lot of motion and uh, energy here today. Sun is out. Uh, not as cold as uh, other times I've been here. And I'm here with LaDonna, uh, Brave Bull Allard. We've spoken many, many times. You're, uh, uh, I, I view as uh, one of the leaders here. Uh, but as you say, there are no leaders. We're all together. And uh, since we last spoke, uh, the easement was granted, uh, the final easement. And then yesterday, a judge denied a temporary restraining order. Uh, <laughs> I find very strangely his rationale saying, well, your religious rights aren't being infringed because the oil's not flowing yet, uh, which I guess we got to wait till the pipeline's built and the oil's flowing to even look at the religious aspect. So I just wanted to ask you your thoughts on, on that judge's ruling as well as uh, where to go now, now that the permit was granted. So um, we always knew the permit was going to be granted. We know that uh, Cheyenne River and Standing Rock filed a TRO, a temporary restraining order, and that was denied. We do know that I think it is the February 27th, they will have their day in court. So it is not um, done. I know that uh, lawyers are working on different legal strategies to go forward. I am really kind of shocked about the oil is not going. It didn't violate our religious rights. Um, that whole statement is an oxymoron to me because it's not about religious rights. It's about sacred rights and the sacred land and the land that they went through and the village sites and the sacred sites that they went through and destroyed before the pipes were in the ground, before the oil went through the pipes. So these are unresolved issues that should be first and foremost with the judge. And I also think uh, uh, the lawyer for Energy Transfer Partners yesterday said that the, the old drilling will be completed uh, as soon as 30 days. He actually said we're trying to make up for lost time. So really, translated, our investors have a gun door ahead. We got to get this oil flowing. We got to get this pipeline moving. So, obviously, all these pipelines break, whether they work slowly or not. But if you're saying we're going to try to get it done in 30 days to drilling, uh, I would think that sets up even more of a guarantee that there will be a spill. So, the original 60 days to complete the drilling, they are trying to push it to 30 days. And right now, if you go through the background of energy transfer, they don't even have the oil to push through the pipes at this point. I see that this is a huge economic disaster for the United States, and they really need an economist to look at the background of what is really happening here. When you say they don't, have, they don't even have the oil to push through, tell me about that. Well, in the Bakken, the oil um, has declined. The amount of oil that is coming out and being pumped is declined, and the price of oil has declined. And I know that they're dreaming that we're going to be paying $3, $4 a barrel. It's not going to happen. And I see all these statements. You know, last week when the easement was granted, you have Republicans like, this is great for America's energy independence, and there's safeguards going in. I mean, and at Phillips 66, which owns a quarter of this pipeline, just had a pipeline explode in Louisiana. Uh, Enbridge, which has had spill after spill after spill, uh, just had a pipeline spill in Texas, 600,000 gallons. As we're speaking, who the hell knows what, what's spilling or what's exploding. So it kind of flies in the face, all this talk of safety and energy independence. Uh, this Enbridge, Phillips 66, Energy Transfer Partners, that's basically 75 to 80% ownership of the pipeline. Enbridge just, just had a spill. Phillips just exploded. And a report recently came out that Energy Transfers has had 69 spills between 2015 and 2016, and that's just what they reported. So who knows what other spills that are small. So it seems like there's a cognitive dissonance between, obviously the corporate media doesn't want to talk about this, but obviously it's not our opinion. The facts are, oh, these are either spilling, exploding, 
and now they're putting it under the Missouri River. And so I want to know which spill site has been totally cleaned. None that I know of. Each of them become a permanent ecological disaster. And right now they are saying they don't have the millions to clean it up. Who is responsible for cleaning up? We end up with the disaster. We end up being the expendable people. I need some kind of insurance that these are going to be cleaned up. And we don't have it. Right now they are making laws to allow the cleanup to not be notified, to um, lessen the EPA laws. Oh wait, to ending the EPA offices. So what is our repercussion? Who do we go to? They're also trying to make a law to lower the threshold for reporting oil spills because they don't, in this state, they barely report it as it is. Now they want to lower it even more to basically, you know, a very, a very large amount uh, in terms of gallons spilled that they actually have to report. And the one that's 150 miles from here, why have we no news of it? Who is cleaning it? What is happening? Is it in the Little Missouri River? Oh, yes. You know, bigger picture, I see that this president's invested in this pipeline. I see that the uh, energy secretary that he appointed was on the board of this pipeline. I see all the banks that are invested in this pipeline. There is divestment going around. But it seems to me like all of these entities, uh, you know, are ra trying to ram it through. But if this was under a pipe, under anything near their homes, the, the current Secretary of Oil, I mean State, excuse me, Rex Tillerson, in 2014 joined a lawsuit against fracking near his house. So it seems to me this is going under, uh, I think, the second largest water source in America. And the President just threw out the, the environmental impact statement. But it's going, the, the water doesn't just go to Native Americans, it goes to white people, black people, straight people, gay people, black, brown, purple, it doesn't matter. And it seems like all of these people, including the Republicans, don't care. What, what are your thoughts overall? Because I'm not, you would think that now that it's been uh, put through, there would be more coverage of this, but I haven't seen anything. You know, we have started with a very simple statement, water is life. And anyone who lives has to have water. It's a very common thing. Everybody has to have water. But when you come to a place in your life where everything is at your hand, you run into a tap and turn it on, there's the water. Why would I have to worry about where the water comes from? But if you live like uh, us who have hauled our water, who take that time every year to go four days with no food and water, who take our lives to fast for things that we stand for. We understand how important that water is. We continue to remind ourselves how important that water is. And when they come to the time in their lives when they have to pay for bottled water owned by the government, they will say, why didn't we stand up then? And let's not even uh, that's not even addressing the fact that Nestle, for example, is price gouging their bottles uh, in places like Flint and elsewhere. So the corporations like to prey on victims of lead contamination and other things. Uh, I wanted to also ask you, over the weekend, you were at a tribal uh, summit in Duluth, and uh, the discussion there was about all these pipelines, and you told me some interesting things before we spoke. So tell us about... Uh, what was talked about there and uh, what the takeaways were. So I was invited by Honor the Earth. They had a conference and they invited the tribal leaders from Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, and Canada to come and all sit at the table to talk about the pipelines, to talk about Enbridge, to talk about Dakota Access, because uh, in the past, the pipelines have been put in the ground. 
um, some 64 years ago. And so in that time, the tribes had at that time agreed to, to any of these things and now are suffering repercussions. And so we gathered everybody to say, now is the time we have to make the decision. So right now with the pipeline that is under Lake Superior, it was only supposed to be there for 50 years. It's been under Lake Superior for 64 years and they are talking about abandoning the pipeline and we're saying, where is the abandonment policy? And, br and, and, and bridges. Yes. What happens when you abandon a pipeline? Who is responsible for cleaning it up? Who is responsible for removing it from the ground? Who is responsible for all the, the additives and chemicals that come from around the pipe that it's been buried so long in the ground? Who is responsible? Who is responsible for cleaning the, the ponds and the lakes and the areas that people live? And there is no answer. And so all the tribal leaders gathered to start talking about what do we do? How do we plan to go forward? One of the things that I seen though was unity. For tribal nations to come together has always been a hard thing because you can come from one nation like many of these are from the Anishinaabe nation, but they are divided into separate reservations and territories. And so the government says, you are only responsible for this part of this territory when really you're responsible for all of this. And so just to get that thought out there that everybody who is sitting there is in unison. For me, it was an amazing me uh, meeting in Duluth, especially to be sitting in the area where you look out on Lake Superior, which is the largest fresh water source in the world that we should be preserving, that people should understand how sacred that lake is and the additional lakes there. It is an amazing resource that we should be protecting and not destroying. And so the meeting was, was really good. People were all sitting at the same table talking to each other. And what I understand in my own mind is any time all the tribal leaders can sit down together with unity, it's power. Because one of the things that the rest of the people in the United States don't have is that traditional knowledge of the ground. We understand the ground, the land, and the environment for thousands of years around us. And we can tell you about the land all around us. And so to have all those people sitting in the same space talking about that land and that water is really important.